Thanks for showing up, guys. I really appreciate it. So um, today, right, the purpose of this was for me to be able to take and give you guys the basic information that most people don't get, right, when it comes to the high intensity interval training that you guys are doing in here, right, and pairing that with nutrition properly, right? A lot of the stuff that we see out there, especially on social media, right, diet culture and all of that, does stuff that provides, you know, promise of temporary fixes, but nothing really long term. Right? And I look at this stuff from a health perspective. And so making sure that you guys understand how to do this stuff healthy, what's right, what's wrong, and how your body actually works, right? When you're doing this stuff, will give you the tools you need to make sure that you have proper expectations, right? And are set up for success long-term with this, right? So um, let's get started here. First thing, a little bit about me. Um, I received my uh, degrees from New Mexico State University back in 2010, biology and chemistry. Um, right now I am finishing my master's in applied nutrition from the University of New England. I will be done in December um, with that. And so from there, um, I'm moving on to get my certified nutrition specialist uh, credentialing. Um, basically that's uh, almost like a dietitian, but with master's level, right? And so we're working on in the United States getting all the dietetics laws up uh, to, to snuff to where um, we can practice, um, you know, with doctors and other things like that to make sure that we provide that medical nutrition therapy that uh, a lot of people need. Um, I am also part of the Central Texas Eating Disorder Specialist Society here in Texas. Um, there's a lot of people on both ends of the spectrum, right, that, uh, that need help. And I'm up in Round Rock, and so my wife and I are some of the few that are actually up in that area that provide services for people with eating disorders. Um, other than that, I have been an ACSM certified personal trainer for uh, seven years now. Um, I maintain my credentialing there. I'm also a NESTA certified fitness nutrition coach. I've had that also for seven years, and so I've worked within the fitness community specifically for, for a while. Um, and then I'm also a dot, uh, dot fit certified supplementation expert. So we can go through, and we'll go through a little bit today about supplements that work, don't work, you know, those kinds of things and what they actually do. That way you guys can ask questions if you have any questions about what may be appropriate for you or not. Do right? you ask questions during or do them out the office? Um, if it's quick and appropriate during the lecture, that's fine. If it's something we want to save for after, that's totally fine as well. <laughs> right, so today our objectives, we're going to define high intensity and normal training, right? A lot of people do this stuff, but don't actually know what high intensity and training actually is right and so we're going to go through it we're going to look at that we're going to identify our macronutrients so our proteins our carbohydrates and our fats right we want to make sure that we actually are aware of the sources of those right i'm also going to give you guys a food list right at the end of this that you guys can take home grocery list that breaks that stuff down okay we're going to understand how your nutrition and your exercise work together right because a lot of people don't pair the nutrition with the body uh, body type that they want Right? I think of it like a marathon runner eating like a power lifter, right? Or somebody who wants to be a power lifter eating like a marathon runner, right? They don't match up. So if you have a specific body type that you want, right, we need to make sure that we get that nutrition paired together so your body will actually change that way, right? And then again, we're gonna learn how to identify the good sources of proteins, carbohydrates, and fat, because there's a lot of sources of those guys, right? But what are actually the good ones um, that we can do to make sure that we get that body composition changed as we want. All right, so I want to know how many of you have had these thoughts, right? You can't lose weight, right, or put on muscle because you're too old. You know, it happens, like seriously, I think that. I'm 40 years old, right? That happens, I'm like, oh man, you're getting too old. It's not gonna happen here, right? Um, or you might think that something's wrong with your metabolism, right? Has anybody ever contemplated going to the doctor to get checked? Like, hey, I can't lose weight, there might be something wrong with me. Right? <laughs> um, I've had clients, some people sit there and say, well, like the specific things is, I might have a thyroid issue, right? We hear about that all the time. My thyroid's not working right, I can't lose weight, right? Exactly, right? And so, <laughs> right, a lot of people may have those thoughts and think that stuff, but they don't actually have those issues, right? And one of the other ones is, you know, I'd start eating healthier, but I'm busy right now, and I'm too busy to start a diet, right? Anybody ever thought that before? No, that's good. I, I've had clients that do that as well. And the, and the whole thing is because everybody has, has it in their mind that diets are hard, right? They're gonna be inconvenient, 
Am I gonna cause extra stress, distress in our life? We're gonna to have to make all of these changes. And when it's done appropriate, right, we don't actually go on a diet, we make slight modifications in our existing nutrition patterns that end up making a, long, uh, a big difference long term, okay? So, really what we need to do is we need to drop the focus on diets and losing weight when we're in here, right? And we need to focus on being healthy and balanced. The body's an amazing thing and it will actually adapt body style wise to what you're feeding it and the exercise that you're giving it, okay? That's why different athletes have different types of body, okay? That's why when I started off and I said, you wanna feed yourself with the type of body that you want, the body will adapt and change that way, right? We need to shift our outlook, especially in here, from looking good to feeling good. Again, they go hand in hand. When you feel good and you can move more and move better, more efficiently, put on muscle mass, right? You end up looking better anyways. And a lot of times from a psychology standpoint, when we feel better, our perception of how we look changes, okay? So it's something to keep in mind as we talk about this, right? We need to keep everything we do in here simple. And that's our exercise and our nutrition. Right? A lot of the fad diets, a lot of stuff you see online, right? they really promise this magic stuff and they try to make it too complicated. Right? It's really not that complicated. We don't need to fast for 16 hours a day. We don't need to completely cut carbohydrates out. We don't need to do a lot of this extreme stuff. It's not that complicated. Okay? We need to realize that our health is not reflected on the scale. It's actually reflected in our energy levels, right? our emotional well-being, and our ability to enjoy our food and our movement. Right? A lot of times we get to the point where we're on a diet and it just becomes too stressful. Right? We don't do it, it's causing us this stress. Right? That means that it's not going to work long term for us. And that's why we have this really big diet and cycling culture of people yo-yoing, right? in and out of exercise, in and out of diets. Right? It's not healthy for us long term. Right? So we need to find a way that we can go ahead and keep it part of our lifestyle and something that we enjoy doing and enjoying our food. Right? And then the long-term weight loss, the weight loss success, right, is more nutrient dependent than exercise dependent, right? You can't out exercise a bad diet, that's really what I'm getting at with that there, right? And so your long-term nutrition habits are going to be more beneficial to you health-wise, right, than exercise. And I don't want to diminish exercise. It's something that we need to do to keep ourselves playing for as long as possible, right? Moving for as long as possible, but nutrition really is going to be the base for everything that you do health-wise moving. Okay? Your best results come when you combine them, obviously, right? Best of both worlds. So, high intensity interval training. What is it? Right? High intensity interval training is a form of exercise in which short periods of extremely demanding physical activity are alternated with less intense recovery periods. So what we do in here, right? Blow it out for 45 seconds, rest period, move to the next one, blow it out again, right? HIIT training um, can train the body to become more efficient at producing and using energy from the anaerobic energy system, right? And so the anaerobic energy system is that system that burns fat, right? Burns muscle glycogen. That's that uh, uh, sustained long-term energy that we need to keep going and going and going, okay? High intensity interval training has been shown to significantly reduce subcutaneous fat, especially abdominal fat, okay? Um, as well as total body mass and improve VO2 uh, max, which is basically your body's ability to do work, right? Um, and insulin sensitivity. So for anybody, right, whenever we exercise, our body becomes more insulin sensitive, which means it's more efficient in using the blood sugar that we have and sucking in the proteins and those fats that we need, right, to, to maintain um, our daily energy stores and moving. And then HIIT can burn more calories, and increases post-exercise fat oxidation and energy expenditure more than steady state exercise. Basically, that's a fancy way of saying that your short time in here, right, when done correctly, is going to burn more fat than going out and just going on a jog for the same amount of time. Okay, so that's one of the big benefits of being in here, right? Now, when we look at how does our body actually burn fat, most people don't realize you burn fat through breathing. Did you guys know that? Right? It's not through sweating, right? It's not through heat. I mean, there's a little bit of that, right? Yeah, but when you're in here and you're dying and you're sweating, I'll stick you in a hot yoga class or a sauna and get you to sweat just as much. You're not burning the fat the same way, right? So here's a quick breakdown of how it works. You have 10 kilograms of fat, about 22 pounds of fat is what that is equivalent to, right? That's this guy right there. You have to breathe in 
almost three times as much oxygen through the air, right? To be able to burn off that 10 grams of fat. Almost 85% comes out from carbon dioxide, right? So that uh, increased respiratory rate that you get in here, not when sitting there hyperventilating, you know, I mean, you'd be great if we drove this back just to go, <laughs> right? But it doesn't happen that way. But when you are forced and your body naturally ramps up that breathing, Right? It's using fat. It's looking for oxygen. That's the anaerobic uh, system that I mentioned before. Right? So your body's breaking down fat. What it's doing is it's taking that fat, it's combining it with the oxygen that you're breathing in, it's giving us uh, carbon dioxide and then water. Okay? So a little bit of that sweat that we have, but we lose a lot of water through our breath as well. Right? So you're breathing that fat out. Okay? The great part about high intensity exercise is not only while you're in here, doing your exercise and breathing hard. But when you get out of here, your body still has this increased oxygen demand. And so it's combining it with that fat that's still circulating around in your system. We call it post uh, oxygen post-exercise consumption, right? So your body's still burning more calories outside of class. That's part of the resistance that you do in here. And that's why we really want you guys to challenge yourselves when you're lifting those weights in here. And it's not just the movement, make those uh, muscles demand that oxygen so you continue to burn fat while you're outside of here, okay? Is that okay for everybody? Right? Breathing hard's a good thing. The more we can do it, not hyperventilating, right? The better off we are. All right, so stuff that you're not gonna like to hear. Studies show that exercise alone can be relatively ineffective for losing weight when not combined with proper nutrition, right? Again, it goes back to the you can't out-exercise a bad diet. This means that the scale won't move much. You can come in here and you can do two a days. You know, there's been a couple of people that have come in doing two days, body doesn't change, scale doesn't change, right? Exercise will help decrease that visceral fat that's stored right around your stomach, right? But it takes a long time for your body to do that, okay? And the, vis the visceral fat accumulation is associated with health issues such as high blood pressure and diabetes. So, especially in guys, when we see that spare tire around there, right, you can look at them and go, mm, they're at a higher risk for, for this. And the same thing goes with females, right? So your body wants to store it there. It's an easy place to access, you know, as far as storage goes. It's the last place your body usually wants to take it from, okay? But when we see those things, we know that we're increasing our health risk for certain uh, metabolic conditions. So the stuff we do like to hear though, is high intensity inter uh, interval training induces improvements in cardio, respiratory fitness, right? Especially in people with heart disease and metabolic disorders. So people that come in that really should be working out, Right? When they start doing this, we see a big increase in their overall health really quick, right? But also for people that are already in shape, we see improve improvements in all of those markers, right? And so you're reducing your risk long-term of developing any diseases. Um, the high-intensity interval training is also effective um, for improving fasting glucose levels and reducing blood pressure, right? A lot of us are stressed out, we sit down a lot for work, our blood pressure starts to go up, you know, especially as we get older, our, uh, you know, there are a lot of people now and it's increasing. A lot of people at risk for diabetes, that pre-diabetes or just diagnosed with type two diabetes. High intensity interval training on its own will help decrease the risk factors of all of those guys. So it's great there, right? High intensity interval training can help increase your metabolic rate over time, okay? So doing consistent high intensity interval training will help raise your lean muscle mass, help drop your body fat down and give you a more favorable body composition over time, right? But it's something that you have to stick with and you have to do consistently, right? And so high intensity interval training can increase lean muscle mass and decrease body fat when combined together. And that's when we see our best results, right? So now we understand kind of a little bit about high intensity interval training, right? We want to look at our proper components for, uh, for health, right? We need to have proper balanced nutrition. We need to be consistent, regular with our exercise. So in here, you know, three to five times a week for those of you that use it as your primary mode of exercise, if not, you know, doing something at least three to five times a week to keep your body, you know, anticipating that exercise, which means your calorie burn stays up, right? And then healthy lifestyle practices. That means that when you're done here, you don't go and spend the rest of your day being sedentary, right? There's a lot of ways that we burn calories. It's not just the 45 minutes that we're in here. And a lot of studies show that that movement outside of here is actually almost equally important when it comes to keeping our body fat percentage down and our muscle up, right? As doing the exercise by itself. So, nutrition time, guys. We're gonna look at macronutrients. 
a breakdown of our calorie usage on a daily basis, right? How your body's actually using those calories. How much energy does your body store for direct usage? So two things, glycogen, which is those carbohydrates that are stored in your muscle and on your liver, and also our body fat, okay? Um, how do you lose or gain fat or muscle, depending on what you need and what pro uh, proper nutrition habits are. All right, macronutrients. Everybody know these guys? Fats, proteins, carbs, right? We need all of them, right? So protein, four kil uh, kilocalories per gram, right? For most people in here, especially when you're exercising, we need to have 25 to 40% of our daily calories coming in through protein, okay? When you're exercising, that basically works out to about 1.2, grams per kilogram, right? And I'll go through this stuff here in a little bit as far as what those actual numbers translate into. Carbohydrates, same amount of calories per gram, four, right? So protein and carbs give you the same amount of, uh, of energy per gram. That needs to be 25 to 50%, right? So a little bit over, you know, 1.5 grams per kilogram, right? Carbs are important, guys, right? It's just all the kinds we get in can make a big difference on how our body uses and stores them, right? And then fat. Fat is essential, but it is also twice the calories plus a little bit more compared to proteins and carbs, right? So fats can creep up in our diet, and even though we're eating healthy, can go ahead and put us in a calorie surplus, and so if we're trying to change our body, right, it might not be the most beneficial if we're getting too much in. That's why this percentage stays a little bit low, about 20 to 30%, right, actually needs to be coming from good healthy fats in our diet. So. And that relates to how our body actually burns calories throughout the day. 60 to 70% of your calorie burn throughout the day, even with your exercise in here, right, comes from just being alive, all right? We do a couple of things. One, we underestimate how many calories our body, uh, how, how many calories our body burns during exercise, and two, how much it needs to actually just stay moving, right? So keeping your organs working, keeping your brain functioning, Right, all of that stuff. Our body uses a lot there. Diet, diet can be a big factor in how many calories you burn, okay? Diet can take up eight to 10% of the amount of calories you burn throughout the day just to break the food down for usage, okay? And a lot of people don't understand that you can manipulate your diet, higher protein, higher fiber content, and get foods in that cost more energy to break down and actually increase your metabolism, right? While you're trying to go ahead and change your body composition. Right, and then 20 to 30 percent, right, comes through that physical activity. Okay, and obviously, the more you work out, the higher that percentage goes. But when you're awake for you know 12, 13, 14 hours a day, you're not going to do you know four, five, six hours uh, of exercise. Right, we're in here for 45 minutes. We maybe can get a little bit outside of here. You know, maybe another hour total. But really, the uh, percentage of our day actually doing physical activity is very small compared to everything else. Right. And so, knowing that, we need to look at what your body actually stores in here for usage, okay? Carbohydrates, those are in your liver, in your muscle, right, and in your body fluids. Basically, you store about 500 calories in your liver. That's to help maintain your blood sugar, right? Anybody ever come in here, work out without eating, and then feel really dizzy and kind of crappy afterwards, right? That's because that guy's gotten too low, right? blood sugar is tanking, there's no way to replenish it, right? The reason that happens is muscle glycogen. This is where most of that immediately accessible energy comes from, especially when we're working out in here. Average person only has about 2,000 calories, right? Now your body doesn't work on a flip of a switch. It's not gonna burn all carbohydrates and then switch to fat and burn all fat and then when you run out of that, go to muscle. It burns percentages of those and I'm gonna show you how that works. But your body is going to regulate that and while you're sleeping at night, it depletes that while you're fasting, right? It wants to stay, it wants to save body fat, right? And so it's gonna go ahead and burn through those carbohydrates at night. When you wake up in the morning, if you don't replenish them and you come in and work out, those of us that burn through carbohydrates quicker, you can have that big drop in uh, metabolism. So, or I mean in blood sugar. So if you guys need to eat a little bit before to restore that when you wake up, totally fine, okay? It's not gonna hurt the fat that you burn when you exercise, okay? Now, fat different story, right? So we have maybe a day's worth of pure energy stored in our muscle glycogen. Well, subcutaneous and visceral fat, so fat all over our body, 72,540 calories. 
Right? That's why you can go weeks living on body fat when you're starving. Okay? We have a lot there. Right? And so your body does that on purpose. Right? Thousands and thousands of years of evolution has taught us, hey, we used to get food for a little while, then we had to go a long time without it, you know, and so our body was storing energy to make sure that we can live through those fasting periods, right? When you exercise and you deplete your muscle glycogen, your body produces those, those hormones, right? Especially when it's on a consistent basis of, hey, I'm burning a lot of calories, fight or flight, right? Store it or burn. Right? If you don't do things right, especially when you're doing extreme diets where you're dropping your calories too low, your body goes into storage mode. Right? It says, hey, I've got hormones, I can flip off that switch for fat burn, and I'm going to go ahead and deregulate everything and store as much fat as possible. So when we're in here working out and we want to drop body fat, you have to make sure that we're actually giving our body enough calories to go ahead and be willing to do that. We can drop it down so low that it will go ahead and almost stop trying to burn fat. Right? And so we're defeating the purpose by not giving ourselves enough calories in the right proportions. Okay? Everybody good so far? All right. So how do we uh, use our macronutrients when we exercise? Right? Protein. It's used sparingly when you work out. Right? Your body doesn't want to have to break down protein. It's expensive metabolically. It costs a lot of energy to break it down, and so the body wants to save it, plus it knows that it has to use it to move, right? So when we do long bouts of intense long-term exercise, right? So marathons, triathlons, that stuff, we end up burning a lot more protein off because the body just ends up running out of accessible energy, right? But doing what we do in here, we're gonna spare a lot of muscle, right? If we work out and recover properly which is great because that helps keep our metabolism up high. Carbohydrates are our primary source of energy and are relied, uh, relied upon during our high intensity exercise. So if you want to come in and just feel really great and work out, you've got to make sure you've got some uh, muscle glycogen. So eating the night before or coming in and having some, you know, some carbohydrates in your body is always a big benefit. You're going to feel better when you're working out. If you're in a calorie deficit or you're cutting back on your carbohydrates for whatever reason, you have to anticipate that you're just not going to feel as good because your body's going to go ahead and cut those out. Yes, ma'am. How long before? Hours and hours before? Well, if we go back to that other slide, you know how we had about, let's just say 2,500 calories, right? You're going to get about, the average person's going to get about an hour and 90 minutes of primary carbohydrate usage, so right? So, yeah, yeah. So okay. if you're going to eat before, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, it depends on your stomach, but you want to go ahead and get, I'd say, it, depending on the person, do two hours, three hours before, right? If you want to make sure your stomach's empty, but usually about an hour before your body's had enough time to break it down so it doesn't start tapping into that too quickly, okay? And then um, fats are used more with our low intensity exercise and longer duration exercises. So once our body starts to run out of carbohydrates when we exercise, it starts to use more fat, okay? Well, when it does that long term, then it's gonna go ahead and start flipping the switch and saying, hey, I can't burn fat at this rate. I need to hold on to it, so we have to be careful there. That's why hip is so great. So, protein, right? The basics of it. We know protein builds lean muscle mass, right? Protein breaks down into amino acids, which are basically the building blocks of the body, right? We need amino acids, okay? It plays the most important role in your immune system, hormone synthesis, and production, and staying alive. Proteins run 99.9% .9 of all of our bodily processes in one way, shape, or form, okay? When we neglect getting enough protein in, especially when we're exercising, is when we really start to see some issues happen because our body has to break down our own muscle to get what it needs to just run our immune system, to run our digestive system, to you know produce hormones that we need to stay alive. Okay, so getting enough protein in when you're exercising is essential. Okay, so uh, protein burns more calories to break down than any other macronutrient. Right? One of the things that I uh, firmly believe in is using a higher protein intake when we exercise to actually decrease body fat while we increase lean muscle mass. And the reason is, is protein, when you ingest it, right, breaks down to, let's just say, out of 100 grams of uh, chicken breast, your body's going to use 30 grams of that just to break it down, and 70 of it is going to be usable. Right? So your body's uh, metabolism has had to raise just to break that protein down, right? And it does that with all forms of protein. So the more protein you eat, right, the more uh, your body has to work to access it, which means the more calories you burn long-term. Plus, 
protein doesn't get stored as body fat unless you're starving on a desert island and eating only chicken breast. Okay, your body's going to go ahead and uh, flush it out through uh, you know natural bodily processes, right? For anything that it doesn't need, right? It wants to store carbohydrates and fat, and so it's going to do that. Okay. Um, when we look at protein and uh, its performance, you know, its essential uh, performance to the body, right? Amino acids, we need them. Branch chain amino acids and essential amino acids. Branch chain and essential are the ones our body cannot produce. Okay, they also, especially the branch chain amino acids, help us recover from exercise quicker. Okay, so if we're looking for a lower calorie way to go about recovery instead of using a protein powder, we can go ahead and use branch chain amino acids and still get the same effect. Okay, one of the papers that I wrote for this program here at UNE that I'm at was studying um, women and leucine, right, and how that stimulates muscle building even outside of exercise, right? And a lot of the research is very promising when it comes to not only maintaining the stimulating and building lean muscle in women while you're dropping body fat off. So um, it's really interesting uh, research. Sources are lean meats, some grains and nuts and protein powders, you know, for your shakes. Um, those are gonna be your best. Vegetables, they carry some amino acids, but none of them carry all of the essential amino acids that we need to be considered a uh, complete protein. So while vegetables are great in their own right, right, when they're coming to a protein source, they're not very good, right? And so when we're doing HIIT training, most females should be getting between 100 to 150 grams of protein per day, okay? That might seem, it might seem a lot, uh, like a lot, but when it's done right, it's not that hard to do. And then guys, uh, because we have a higher uh, muscle mass capacity, um, we need to do between 150 to 200 grams a day to support everything that we need, okay? Carbohydrates, they provide the body with energy, right? So not only does your brain run off carbohydrates, but all of your organs do, okay? And when we deplete carbohydrates, there are some organs that cannot survive without it. And your body will find a way to make carbohydrates internally. And that's gonna be using fats and your muscle, okay? We've got a cycle in our body called the TCA cycle, and it will take whatever it can and make glucose out of it when it's, uh, when it's needed, okay? so. When you see things like keto, and your brain can run off of ketones, that's okay, right? But there's certain things like your heart, right? Your intestines, uh, you know, or internal organs that can't. And so your body's gonna find a way to make it no matter what, right? Why deprive yourself when you can do it? Um, give it what it needs and feel a lot better anyways, right? And so necessary for vital organ function. Carbohydrate strategies and needs, right? For this one, two to five grams per kilogram, or about 150 to 400 uh, uh, grams, let's put the kilograms up there, grams per day um, for exercise activity. And that all depends on the duration of exercise that you're doing. If you're gonna go run a marathon, you need a lot of carbohydrates to keep your energy up, right? Your body just can't burn fat at a high enough rate for that long of time, right? Consuming carbohydrates post-exercise, right? It restores your blood sugar levels, so you can actually feel better for your recovery. Two, it's gonna give you a little bit of an in, uh, insulin spike, which means you're gonna recover better because you get to shovel in protein a lot easier too. When we eat carbohydrates along with protein, put out these little receptors out there on our muscles and it grabs onto those guys and sucks them in, okay? So carbohydrates and protein post-exercise, carbohydrates don't get stored as fat, it just replaces that glycogen, your body's still gonna burn fat, right? And you get that protein in to help you recover. So you're gonna be stronger, better, faster, that next day, and you won't have that post-exercise mental fog that sometimes we get if we don't eat right afterwards. When you say okay. post-exercise, mm -hmm. how, how soon after? Most studies show a typical anabolic window lasts up to about 90 minutes, right? But really, um, it depends on you know what you can get in. Uh, but I say anywhere with up, up, and up to about two hours post-exercise, depending on how you feel, right? It's gonna be about the best way to do it. So if you can do it right after, great, if not, not a big deal when you get home, eating regular breakfast, a little bit of carbohydrates, um, and some protein is good, right? You'll see people that say, hey, need to do intro workout, right? Keep yourself going. We don't work out long enough in here for anybody to need, right? Having anything uh, in their system um, while we're exercising other than water, okay? And the food that you've eaten before. So if anybody ever tells you, hey, you need to have something that's gonna give you energy during the workout, you don't need it, you're not gonna break it down fast enough. That's only for exercise that, that lasts um, continuously for over 90 minutes or so, okay? 
fat. Fats are essential. They make up all of our cells. We need fat, right? Out of the three macronutrients, something I forgot to put on the slides, proteins, carbs, and fats, right? You can live on two of those, right? What's the one that you don't need? Carbohydrates, right? Because your body will find a way to make it through proteins and fats. If we take protein or fats away from you, you'll die, right? Your body has to have those for cell replication, right? It plays a vital role in hormone and cholesterol production. We need cholesterol, right? And they are the most calorie dense macronutrients. So when you need that energy, right? Fats are gonna be there to help give it to you. They're also very satiating. So good fats will help keep you fuller longer, right? And so we know that we just, again, knowing that they're nine uh, calories per gram versus four with protein and carbs, we wanna make sure that we're just not consuming too much of them, right? All right, so using fat for performance and our body composition, right? Fats are needed to maintain energy balance, right? If our body's not getting enough dietary fat in, guess what it doesn't wanna do? doesn't want to let it go, right? So it's kind of counterintuitive. Our body is going to sit there and say, I'm not getting enough good fat in. I need to hold on to what I have, right? And so it doesn't want to let it go. We want to get enough fat in through our diet, right? We need to make sure that the fats are there to um, not only support, you know, the, the cellular repair and replication that I mentioned, right? But to supply uh, essential fats, right? There's fats that our body can't make. And so we need to get those through the diet so our body can operate properly, okay? Our recommended dietary intake is between 50 to 30% of our total uh, daily energy requirements, depending on your needs and your lifestyle, right? Lower it if you're a little bit less active, right? You come in here and work out, so as you're getting your proteins and your carbs, you're fine, right? If you have more of an active lifestyle, we wanna increase your fat because your body is gonna be burning more of those throughout the day. And the other thing is, is um, we need fats for vitamin, uh, vitamin absorption, okay? So our body will, uh, store vitamins in the fat, and there's the specific ones it does that with, right? Those guys um, will start to deplete when our body fat gets too low, and it affects our metabolism. Okay, so making sure that we're getting fats in when we eat actually helps soak up those good vitamins, right? All right, so now that we know those guys, this is the percentages that I was talking about what your body actually burns when you're exercising, okay? Now, this is during our time frame in here, right? I'm not doing it for long term because that does shift, right? But our heart rate monitors back there, you guys see those percentages that come up? That's like these percentages right here. Okay, that's why I brought this up. So when you're at 25% of your max heart rate, you're burning primarily fat, right? That's walking around, not doing a whole lot, right? Maybe just walking down to the corner store, or, you know, taking the dogs on a walk you're gonna burn primarily fat during that time because the body doesn't need, need immediate energy through carbohydrates, right? It's great, but you're not burning a whole lot of fat calories, right? So when we step it up a little bit, we come in here and we work out like we do on a resistance day, right? We start to burn more carbohydrates, right? We also start to burn more glucose, right? So we see this increase here, Right, that's from our muscle, that's our the, the easily accessible carbohydrates there, plus we're burning it here, and then we've got a lot more fatty acid usage. Okay, so we're starting to burn muscle triglycerides, which is this big portion here, right? And then we also have our fatty acids. So you notice these guys, when you combine these two, you're burning more fat in here, but you're also starting to burn more carbohydrates. Right? So now our fat and our carbohydrate usage has gone up in here. Right? Now, when we do those really hard cardio days, that's when we're really tearing through those carbohydrates. That's when it's really important to go ahead and replenish those guys so your body can continue to burn fat outside of exercise and build that lean muscle, okay? And so you're gonna burn a much larger percentage of muscle glycogen, but again, we're also gonna burn a large percentage of fat, okay? And so we're getting the benefit of all of that. The big thing here is the harder we go, the more protein we start to break down, right? So if we don't replenish those carbohydrates and those proteins afterwards, we're gonna start losing lean muscle mass, which long-term will make us worse overall because we're gonna lower our metabolism, we're not gonna be able to work out as hard, right? The whole idea, you know, especially once we get past about 25, 30 years old, is maintaining lean muscle mass. That makes the biggest difference for us when it comes to quality of life, okay? So, 
How should I eat to allow my body to change, right? To lose fat, you've got to be in a calorie deficit, right? It's that whole burn more than you're taking in thing, right? To gain weight or to increase your lean muscle, you must be in a calorie excess, right? Boom. Now, one thing here, and I put it up here, is after initial adaptation period, anybody who starts an exercise routine usually has about two or three months where the body will do both because it is just trying like hell, right, to adapt to this new stress that it's giving you, right? And so it's gonna start burning off body fat and it's gonna start increasing lean muscle mass. Those guys level off, okay? The better shape you get in, the harder it is to burn off body fat and the harder it is to increase lean muscle mass. Okay, your body starts to get efficient at what it does, and that's what we want, right? That's you actually getting healthy, right? Not everybody does that the same way, right? We all look different, you know, especially when it comes to our lifestyle and the way we move, and that's why the focus needs to shift from not just being on a diet and getting our body fat low, right, and looking good in the mirror, but how well do we move, especially in here and on a daily basis, because that's the real representation of how healthy we actually are, right? When we're looking at meal timing and strategy to go ahead and accomplish our goals, right? Different strategies work for different people. And I want to emphasize this because I actually had a gentleman, right, as we were walking out, or they were walking out of class, ask me about intermittent fasting, right? Intermittent fasting works for some people because it works with their lifestyle, right? Some people just aren't hungry when they wake up in the morning. They naturally only eat, you know, during about a 10, you know, eight to 10 hour window throughout the day. They want to do intermittent fasting. That's totally fine for them. Some of us, me, right? When I wake up in the morning, I'm starving, right? That's the first thing I do as soon as I get out of the shower is I go right down and I eat. I have to. I feel like crap for the rest of the day if I don't, right? My feeding window is more of a 16-hour eating window, you know, throughout the day. Um, and so those things don't work for me. So we need to pick a strategy that we, um, that we like that will work with our natural lifestyle. When we have to break our habits and our routine too much, we're setting ourselves up for failure. Right? And so when you see, again, those things online, whether it's keto or paleo or intermittent fasting or Whole30 or whatever it is, right? If it's something you naturally do, we can modify it to work within your lifestyle where you're still getting everything that you need and not having to cut out whole food groups um, and causing health issues potentially there. But, you know, we can make it to where you can be successful long term, okay? You gotta do what makes us feel best. Right? Fasted exercise may increase fat burn when you're in here, right? Um, but it can inhibit your energy during exercise. So there's a trade off, right? Some people sit there and say, hey, I'd like to work out, you know, um, whenever I haven't had anything in my stomach because I just feel a little bit better. That's great. Do it, right? But you don't have to. Okay? There's studies that show, hey, if you can get used to doing that, you're going to burn a little bit more fat during that time. Right? But if you work out in the afternoon, it's almost infeasible because you're having to fast pretty much the whole day and you don't want to do that. So that primarily is for morning workouts, right? But research does not show a significant difference between overall weight loss and fasted and fed exercise, right? So when you look at people over a year, two years, it doesn't matter. The whole, the whole thing is about calories in, calories out, right? So long-term calorie deficit, you're gonna lose weight, right? Long-term calorie uh, surplus, you're going to gain weight, right? Either through muscle or fat, right? So it's about long-term trends, right? And then carbohydrates and protein are essential for proper recovery and muscle repair, okay? So we wanna make sure, again, that we're getting those guys in. Um, what, uh, the diets that you see on the internet, you know, and hear from nutrition gurus, right? Most of them are crap and they do more harm than good. Okay, I mean, that's just the honest truth, right? They're, um, most of them are excessively restrictive and unsustainable. Um, they cause nutrient deficiencies um, and they can cause or exacerbate eating disorders or disordered eating behaviors, right? Um, so real quick, what's the big theme, right, between all of these major fad diets? And this goes way back, right? I mean, we're talking like Atkins and, you know, uh, a bunch of the older diets. What's the biggest common theme about the, those guys that you see? No carbs, right? Or extremely low fat, right? That was a big thing, you know, in the 80s and early 90s, right? These things are very restricting and they're causing you to eliminate, right? A whole macronutrient group of food groups, right? Well, short term, if you have to do that out of necessity, right? Not a big deal. But what it does is it creates nutrient deficiency, 
right? So all of those vitamins and minerals and you know metals and all the stuff your body needs that you get through various food sources, your body starts to run low on, right? And what people don't understand is when you do these restrictive diets, one, not only are you forcing your body to adapt to something that it doesn't like to do, but two, long-term nutrient deficiency can cause a lot of issues. And one of the big things with my athletes that I talk about is you're gonna run out of those vitamins and nutrients and your body's gonna stop burning fat as efficiently as it can. It's gonna stop building muscle as efficiently as it can, right? It's running low on the stuff that it needs to operate on a daily basis. You're slowing your metabolism down, right? Which is defeating the purpose of whatever diet you're trying to do, right? And you're gonna start affecting lean muscle mass. You set your body up hormone-wise to create more stress hormones and cause a lot more issues. So bad diets, I am firmly against, right? You wanna do stuff that's nutritionally sound and science and research based, right? Um, one of the other things that it does is people with existing eating disorders or a history of eating disorders, it really can bring those guys to the surface, right? And what I see a lot of in the fitness community, especially for men and women, you know, doing bodybuilding and physique and bikini and those types of things, is it ends up creating eating disorders, right? Or disordered eating patterns because it gets our mind wrapped around good and bad, right? So carbs of the devil, right? Sugars, right? They're gonna make you fat and make you die. Well, anything in excess, right, will do that, right? And you laugh, but I mean, a lot of the advertisements and stuff that you see and a lot of the way people push stuff, that's really what it is, right? This is going to make you a superhero, or this is gonna cause you to die. There's not a whole lot of in between when it comes to the way that a lot of this stuff is pushed. Right? And when you hear this consistently, social media, right? All the advertisements, it's in magazines, right? It's in our social groups. When we see that stuff, we start to buy in and we start to question what we know, right? My job, right, when I'm here with you guys, is to make sure that if you have any questions, we can get around that crap, right? And really look at what's good for you long-term to make sure you guys are doing the stuff you need to, to be healthy, and we're not just going from this diet to this diet, or, you know, trying different things. We can find something, be patient, and work on it long-term. All right, so proper food nutrition habits. We need to make sure that we get enough protein and fiber on a consistent basis. People that work out in here, these are the two things that I find they don't get enough of, right? You've gotta get enough protein to help maintain your lean muscle mass, to help um, keep your uh, immune system healthy, your hormone levels healthy, right? Fiber. Fiber is one of those things, you guys know that you know, gut nutrition is a big thing right now, right? We're hearing a lot about gut health, microbiome, right? Your, your body um, really communicates in a lot of different ways. And what we know now is a lot of the bacteria and stuff, the good bacteria in our gut, right, lives off of fiber, right? That's what makes it healthy and strong. And those things produce certain vitamins and minerals for us. They help produce hormones for us. They help us regulate our hunger signal, right? And our energy pathway signal, right? So getting enough fiber in really helps maintain a good, healthy gut level, right? It'll help reduce inflammation, um, and it'll really help your body balance itself out long-term, right? So we stick to those guys and make sure that our body's getting enough to repair and also keep us healthy internally, right? We don't want to avoid carbohydrates, but simple carbohydrates and, and sugars, we need to keep to a reasonable level, okay? Anybody in here look at nutrition labels? Yeah, right? It's not a bad, uh, uh, it's not a bad habit to get into, right? And really, the way they make stuff taste good is fat and sugars, right? And so just looking at the back of the stuff that we buy and just making sure that there's not a whole lot of sugars, you know, so anything, you know, that, you know, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 grams per serving, that's a lot of sugar, right? We want higher in fiber, high in carbohydrates, not bad, but we're looking for those simple sugars, right? Complex carbs are great for us. And so carbohydrates aren't bad, we just wanna make sure we keep those simple sugars down, right? We want to eat a variety of fruits, vegetables, and grains. I know you guys hear that a lot. The reason is, is all of them have different vitamins and minerals that we need to get, okay? You don't need to eat the rainbow every day, right? Uh, as far as your, your fruits and vegetables go, but to make sure that throughout a week, throughout a month, you're rotating in, right? Different colors of different foods, um, from different styles of vegetables and things like that, just to make sure that you're covering all the bases. Right? Our body doesn't burn through all the vitamins and minerals that we get every day. It will store them and use them as needed. Right? But we don't want to do 
what we don't want to do is we don't want to get in nutrition habits where we just don't eat certain kinds of food and we become low right, in some of those essential vitamins and nutrients that we need. So getting that variety in is a great thing. Again, when you do this, you're automatically increasing your fiber intake, right? And so people with low fiber intake, whenever I actually get them to increase the fiber intake, they sit there and say, hey, I'm spending a lot more time around my core sunburn, right? Your body as your good um, gut, uh, gut bacteria builds up, right? Your body adapts to that, okay? So those things are usually just short term, right? Other than that, we want to avoid eating out and eating processed foods on a consistent basis, right? Today's lifestyle, guys, it's hard. Right? I mean, we can buy pre-made food anywhere. We don't have to drive to McDonald's, right? Whole Foods, I see people you know, crowded around like food troughs, right? Their pre-made stuff that's out there that they're putting in their boxes to go. I see it at uh, HEB, things like that. And those guys are just like eating at fast food restaurants. They use a lot of sugars and a lot of fats in their foods to make them taste good so people wanna buy them, right? I know it's tough, but the more you can prep at home, the more you can cook at home, right? The better it is for you because you can uh, can control what's in there, sodium level, fats, and carbs level, right? You can also um, reduce all the other preservatives and stuff that they put in food that may make it tough for us to go ahead and access the nutrients that we need, right? And make it easier for your body to store that fat and those carbohydrates um, that we may not actually necessarily eat. So, you know, if you're doing three times a week, that's okay. Any more than that, you know, it becomes um, an uncontrollable calorie level where we might get more in than we really think. You know, when we go out and eat, usually those foods are a lot higher in calories, even though we can keep the portion smaller. They use, again, a lot of fats to cook and, and things like that. So just be careful with it, okay? It's not saying that you can't do it, obviously, but be conscious and mindful. If you notice, hey, the last couple of weeks, like every night I'm eating out, right? Start to look for, you know, ways to do it at home, okay? Meal prep, I'm a big, big advocate of meal prep, okay? Finding things that you can do that will last two or three days, so you always have those, right? In case you're in a pinch, okay? I know uh, Candace sees me, I always walk in with my little dock big cooler bag. I pretty much carry food with me everywhere I go, right? I've got a four-year-old daughter who eats like I do about every 30 minutes, and so, <laughs> you know, I'm just in the habit of carrying those things around, of course, but it makes a big difference because we don't stop you know, and just pick up some chips and something at a corner store. We're not going to a fast food restaurant real quick to go and grab some stuff. I always just have it there, right? And so we can control that um, in our lives and still get the foods in that we like, right? Some people, not all, but some people, you can log your food, um, you know, in any of the apps that are out there, MyFitnessPal, NutritionRx, all of those guys, they're great. What it does is it allows us to just see where we're at, right? I'm not an advocate of using these apps long term, right? We shouldn't have to rely on them. We should be able to, you know, uh, be mindful um, of our eating habits. But if you really want to know, hey, how much protein am I actually taking in? How much carbo, you know, how many carbohydrates? How much fat, right? You can get on and you can start logging your food, especially if you eat out. My Fitness Pal has a great portion on their app where you can actually walk into the restaurant, find it on there, and they'll pull up their menu. Right? And they're getting more and more extensive with it and it works really well because then you can sit there and say, oh my God, the thing that I normally get is like 1,500 calories. You know, I don't know how many times I've been into a, uh, a restaurant when we're out of town or family and friends, we go to Chili's, it's like, hey, I'm gonna go ahead and get the, you know, the honey Dijon chicken uh, salad. It's like 1,400 calories, right? 900 of those calories are coming through the, the um, salad dressing that they put on. Right, little things like that. And so it all, uh, you know, it'll just adjust your perception and you can sit there and say, maybe that's not as good for me as I thought, right? Maybe I'm getting in a lot more sodium than I thought. Maybe I'm just, I'm way short on my protein even though I feel like I'm eating enough. Then we can explore strategies to go ahead and make those adjustments in your daily routine to make you more successful with that stuff long term, okay? Supplements. Anybody in here take multivitamin, any kind of supplements? Yeah? Sometimes, every once in a while, right? Most people I talk to, it's like, I think multivitamin, when I remember, right? Or calcium or whatever it is. Well, there's, there's a ton out there and they all have different purposes. Four in here for F45, the ones I wanted to bring up were protein, or branched chain amino acids, creatine, and beta alanine, okay? These guys actually have solid scientific um, research behind them showing their efficacy and how they can help us out in here, right? Multivitamin, 
I always recommend a multivitamin for anybody who's in a calorie deficit. Why? Because we're usually lowering our calorie intake and it makes it tougher to get in um, uh, those micronutrients that we need, right? Those vitamins and minerals and all of that stuff. We end up burning through those guys. Remember the fat soluble ones that I talked about? What do you start running the one when you start burning fat? Fat soluble vitamins, right? That's gonna ensure it's not going to prevent any disease or anything, but it's going to just ensure that we have those gaps filled and your body can continue to operate at peak efficiency. Okay? Protein or branched chain amino acids, depending on your lifestyle and what will work best for you. If we need to get calories in, protein, right? Keeps us looking good like oh over there, right? Keeps that muscle on. Right? The addition of protein and BCAAs before or after resistance training can increase protein synthesis and gains in lean mass beyond normal adaptation. That means if you did not take it, just worked out and went home and did your daily routine, you'd get certain results by adding in branched chain amino acids or protein, you're gonna actually build more lean muscle mass. Long term, more, more lean muscle means more calorie burn, right? More calorie burn means more fat burn, okay? So when we're looking at long term, we wanna change our body composition, those guys are great. We need more calories, I recommend doing protein, right? Whey protein or a combination of whey and casein. BCAAs, they don't add any calories to our diet, right? So if we just want the recovery, especially that leucine isoleucine and valine, we can do BCAAs and it's still gonna help us recover a lot faster, okay? So we can take those. Creatine, everybody has mixed feelings on creatine. Creatine is not bad for anybody, men or women, okay? Creatine just supplies energy for exercise. It supplies a phosphate group to ATP, right? It allows us to work out harder. There's a ton of research behind creatine, and creatine is the most effective nutritional supplement available to athletes, right, that do high, uh, high intensity exercise. It increases that capacity. It increases muscle uh, mass during tra uh, training, and creatine monohydrate is the most effective form. Okay. There are studies out there as well that show that there may be a potential benefit when it comes to cognitive function because it increases how our body can go ahead and supply energy. So creatine can make you smarter too. Okay. Just a quick question. I've heard that you take this as a supplement though that the body um, gets lazy and doesn't produce naturally as much calories. There's no research that shows that. No. Now, your body's gonna use what it needs. It will store a little bit in the muscles. You're just making sure that you've got enough in there, right? Anything it doesn't use, it's gonna go ahead and shuttle out, okay? Beta alanine, this is another one. The research has found that beta alanine supplementation decreases the rate of fatigue, which means you can work out harder, longer, right? This can translate into strength gains and improved performance. Basically, what beta alanine does is it goes in and it's a lactic acid buffer. Right? And so, whenever you produce lactic acid in your muscles, that's what makes you sore, right? It starts to make you weak, make you fatigue. This goes in there and helps reduce the effects of that lactic acid buildup, okay? Beta alanine will make you tingle a little bit. Call it the beta bites, okay? Everybody experiences that. Anybody in here taken niacin before? No? If you have, it'll make niacin. It'll make you uh, a little bit red and make you tingle. Beta alanine kind of makes it tingle the same way it just doesn't turn you red. Once your body gets used to it, it, it uh, really kind of reduces that effect. Um, but these three, right, if it's something you're interested in, I'd love to talk to you guys about it. They will help you with your performance in here. They do not affect, right, the way that you burn uh, fat or, um, you know, hold on to water, any of that stuff that you may have heard before. Um, these guys are, are great and effective. Um, we can talk about if it's appropriate for you guys, okay? So, what I'm going to give you guys today is I'm gonna give you guys basically this food list, okay? I have the, on the yellow piece of paper up there, you put down your, um, your information for me. I'm gonna send you the slide presentation. I'm also gonna send you this grocery list, okay? Now, this is not an exhaustive grocery list. This isn't everything that you need to buy and only this, but what it does is it gives you a good idea of the different um, breakdown of places for proteins and carbs and fats, okay? You'll notice that the vegetable list is longer than anything else on here, right? It's because we need that variety and we need those guys for the micronutrients, for the fiber, right? To help support, right, a healthy system. We have seafoods, good nuts and seeds, things that supply us with good fats, right? Beans and legumes, these guys are great to throw in because they provide us with a lot of stuff. Carbohydrates, um, you know, proteins and fats, right? So those guys are fantastic. 
your lean poultry and meats, okay? Not the big fatty ones. Eggs and dairy, right? Grains and tortilla. Um, and here I threw in some higher fiber, lower calorie um, options for those guys, um, for both the eggs and dairy and the grains and tortillas. And then the herbs and spices that don't add any calories, right? But provide us with good nutritional benefit, okay? So you guys will get that. It's a great way to go ahead and base your stuff around it. And then, you know, from there we can talk about if you ever have any questions about, hey, what about substitutes for this? Or does this fall under this or under that? But when you go grocery shopping, you can start to look for a variety of things based on that list. Cool? All right, guys, that's it for the lecture. I wanted to give enough time for some questions and answers. So anything you guys have, hit me with it and I'll see what I got. Go ahead. I travel every other week. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I fly on a permanent. I can't put it in my car. In yeah. fact, they found them flying west coast. Okay. So I typically go with some food quakes. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But I feel like there's other things that are kind of probably better than here, which would be blends, brews, and some like, you know, just a, and there's, there's options, mm -hmm. but not a lot. Mm -hmm. What do you, what, what's the two minutes? Three? Do I eat peanut butter packets? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, no, are you exercising when you're traveling as well? Yes. Okay, good. Yeah, you know, the, so there's a couple of different strategies that I usually recommend for people that travel a lot. One, yeah, bring the stuff that you can with you. You know, things like beef jerky or, um, you know, nuts and those kinds of stuff. But when you're actually traveling, they're great little snacks to go to instead of eating in the airport, you know? Um, but uh, do you travel to the same places consistently? Yes. Okay you find spots and locations. There are restaurants and places like that that have healthy foods, right? When I mentioned my fitness pal, it's a great tool, okay. right? Because you can go in and you can strategize what you want to eat and look at the menu. I mean, sushi there. I mean, yeah. not a... Sushi is fantastic, <laughs> okay. right? We just, we don't want to do, yeah, we, we don't want to do the Las Vegas rolls, right? Because there's yeah. cream cheese, they're deep fried, you know? And yeah. 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 yeah, so. The Portland, Seattle, all of that. Oh okay. yeah. Yeah, so doing things like your 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 lighter rolls and like your like your and sashimi, uh -huh. fantastic. Eat okay. as much of that as you want, right? Um, loading up on vegetables anytime you get a chance. So things that you can travel with, you know, fruit, bananas and apples and nuts and stuff like that are usually always good. And then the other thing I recommend is if you travel a lot consistently, you'll find a grocery store, right? If it's near you, take your list, right? And just get those essential things. So usually you have at least a small refrigerator. Right, that you can go in and get some of those little essential things and just make life a little bit easier. Second question. Yes, ma'am. I put greens in a in the what do you call it, blender. Mm -hmm. Does that is that better than cold pressed? I mean, am I getting the fiber if I put it in the yeah. versus buying cold pressed? So if you want to actually get the beneficial stuff out of the vegetables, you have to have the fiber in there. So throwing them in a blender is great, right? It starts to break it down so your body doesn't have to work quite as hard, right, to get the stuff out of it, but at least you're getting in that fiber. You're still maintaining um, those micronutrients and everything that your body needs, so those are good. Last two. Mm -hmm. Let's press protein. Mm -hmm. I think this is off your ass. Okay. Weight. Yeah. Protein kind of makes sense for greens, mm -hmm. but we recommend another one. And two, is there a good meal plan for working out like lunch? hours before or hours after or how many grams of saturated fat versus I know zero saturated mm -hmm. fat but do you have a, a website mm -hmm. or an app that you recommend or a plan that we can go on to to kind of put the daily the current we'll talk about this afterwards okay. so we're, we won't take up the time for the other class but yeah definitely we can definitely do that yes ma'am so I always struggle with having higher protein while not increasing fat mm -hmm. No, so um, any issues with dairy or eggs or any of that stuff? Eggs, no, dairy. No. Okay, okay. So when we don't have that, you know, really, um, egg whites are fantastic, 
right? We have some soy based stuff. Um, oh, yeah, right. yeah, it's down, whatever it is. Right, that's actually really high in protein. And it's great. Um, I love using things. Um, as I mentioned beef jerky before. I also love using protein powders. Um, there's a lot of stuff on that list, and I'll show you there. Um, I mentioned we sent you a list of higher protein grains, things like quinoa, tamarind, um, you know, legumes. Um, I get uh, a. Um, it's a. It's pre-made, but it's a pea and pro, uh, lentil-based protein um, pasta from Modern uh, Table. Right, it's like 18 grams of protein per serving, and they do a ton of different ones. Right, and so um, those are always options as well, and they're really nice. You can make them and then take them with you as you go. So yeah, there's a lot of options. I just have to send you a list. Kind of so yeah. So. Yeah, it really depends. I mean, you know, there's a lot of going around about collagen and, and you know, glucosamine and, you know, chondroitin and all of that stuff. Um, I haven't seen any research that shows any significant changes, right? Really, typically, um, making sure that you're nutritionally complete, right? If you're not overdoing it on exercise when it comes to stress on the joints, um, you know, you get a lot of the, the stuff that's in those guys through nutrition anyways. Um, but if there are any big issues, you know, you can look at doing things like a, a type 2 collagen, um, you know, replacement and some things. But yeah, as far as joint supplements go, um, really it comes down to just making sure we're doing the stuff that we actually need to do to keep the joints lubricated and let the body rebuild from there. And last question. Mm -hmm. um, so, <coughs> if you have a balanced diet, but you are doing like doubles here or whatever, mm -hmm. um, so you're going to need the extra stuff. Be the B, C, A, A, is the creatine and the PCA. Mm. Right. So, is there one supplement that they can combine that kind of thing? Um, there are a couple of options. There's not going to be one that has all of them, but there are some that combine creatine with beta alanine and then you just do the BCAs with it. Um, I actually have a good source of that, so I'll get that to you with as well. So, but yeah, that's a good question. So, any other questions? All right, guys. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate you coming in.